Changes of shape, new forms, are the themes which my spirit impels me. Now to recite, inspire me, O gods. It is you who have even transformed my art, and spin me a thread from the world's beginning down to my own lifetime in one continuous poem. Before the earth and the sea and the all-encompassing heaven came into being, the whole of nature displayed but a single face, which men have called chaos, a crude, unstructured mass, nothing but weight without motion, a general conglomeration of matter composed of disparate, incompatible elements. No Titan, the sun-god, was present to cast his rays on the universe, nor Phoebe, the moon, to replenish her horns and grow to her fullness. No earth suspended in equilibrium, wrapped in its folding mantle of air, nor Amphitrite, the goddess of ocean, to stretch her sinuous arms all around the earth's long coastline. Although the land and the sea and the sky were involved in the great mass, no one could stand on the land or swim in the waves of the sea, and the sky had no light, none of the elements kept its shape, and all were in conflict inside one body, the cold with the hot, the wet with the dry, the soft with the hard, and weight with the weightless. The god who is nature was kinder and brought this dispute to a settlement. He severed the earth from the sky and parted the sea from the land. He separated translucent space from the cloudier atmosphere. He disentangled the elements, then gave them their separate places and tied them down in a peaceful concordant. Fire flashed out as a weightless force in the vaulted heaven and found its rightful place at the height of the firmament. Air came next in position and lightness. Earth was denser than these, attracted the larger particles, and sank through the downward thrust of its own weight. In the nether region came water, confining the solid disk in its liquid embrace. When the god, whichever one of the gods, had divided the substance of chaos and ordered it thus in its different constituent members, first, in order that earth should hang suspended in perfect symmetrical balance, he molded it into a shape of a great sphere, Next he commanded the seas to scatter and swell as they fronted the blast of the winds, surrounding the earth with its circle of shore. To the ocean he added the springs, huge standing pools in the lakes, and rivers to wind downstream as their sloping banks confined them. These in their various places may be absorbed by the earth itself, or travel as far as the sea, where they enter the broad expanse of more water and beat on the shore instead of their banks. Then he commanded the plain to extend and the valleys to sink, the woods to be decked in their leaves and the rock-faced mountains to soar, and just as the sky is cut into zones, with two to northward, two to the south, and a fifth which burns with more heat than the others, so with the earth which the sky encloses, the god in his wisdom ordained five separate zones or tracks to be traced on its surface. The central zone is too hot for men to inhabit the region. Two are buried in snow, but two he placed in between, and thus he blended the heat with the cold in a temperate climate. Hanging over the lands is the air, whose weight exceeds that of fire by as much as the weight of earth exceeds that of water. It was here that the god commanded the mists and the clouds to settle. Here he posted the thunder to trouble the hearts of men with the winds which cause the lightning that burns and lightning that flashes. Still the Creator did not allow the winds dominion over the whole wide range of air. As it is, they can scarcely be stopped from tearing the world to pieces, though each of them governs his blasts in a distant quarter, so angrily brothers can quarrel. Eurus's retreat is the home of the dawn from the realms of Arabia, and Persia through to the mountains that gleam in the morning sunlight. Zephyr is close to the evening, and fans the shores that are warmed by the setting sun. Boreas, lord of the blizzards, sweeps into Scythia, land of the frozen north, while Auster, opposite, drenches the soil of the south with his clouds of incessant rain. Above the turbulent lower air the creator imposed the weightless translucent ether, untainted by earthly pollution. Nature had hardly been settled within its separate compartments, when stars, which had long been hidden inside the welter of chaos, began to explode with light all over the vault of heavens, and lest any part of the world should be wanting its own living creatures, the floor of heaven was richly inlaid with the stars and the planets, 
The waves of the sea were assigned as the realm of glinting fish. The earth was the home of the beasts and yielding air of the birds. Yet a holier living creature, more able to think high thoughts, which could hold dominion over the rest, was still to be found. So man came into the world. Maybe the great artificer made him of seed divine in a plan for a better universe. Maybe the earth that was freshly formed and newly divorced from the heavenly ether retained some seeds of its kindred element. Earth, which Prometheus, the son of Iapetus, sprinkled with raindrops and molded into the likeness of gods who govern the universe. Where other animals walk on all fours and look to the ground, man was given a towering head and commanded to stand erect, with his face uplifted to gaze on the stars of heaven. Thus clay, so lately no more than a crude and formless substance, was metamorphosed to assume the strange new figure of man. First to be born was the golden age of its own free will. Without laws or enforcement, it did what was right and trust prevailed. Punishment held no terrors, no threatening edicts were published, and tablets of bronze, secure with none to defend them, the crowd never pleaded or cowered in fear in front of their stern-faced judges. No pine trees had yet been felled from its home on the mountains and come down into the flowering waves for journeys to lands afar. Mortals were careful and never forsook the shores of their homeland. No cities were yet ringed round with deep, precipitous earthworks. Long, straight trumpets and curved bronze horns never summoned to battle. Swords were not carried, nor helmets worn, no need for armies, but nations were free to practice the gentle arts of peace. The earth was equally free and at rest, untouched by the hoe, unscathed by the plowshare, supplying all needs from its natural resources. Content to enjoy the food that required no painful producing, men simply gathered arbutus fruit and mountain strawberries, cornell cherries and blackberries plucked from the prickly bramble, acorns too which they found at the foot of the spreading oak tree. Spring was the only season, flowers which had never been planted, were kissed into life by the warming breath of the gentle zephyrs, and soon the earth, untilled by the plough, was yielding her fruits, and without renewal the fields grew white with the swelling corn blades. Rivers of milk and rivers of nectar flowed in abundance, and yellow honey distilled like dew from the leaves of ilex. When Saturn was cast into murky Tartarus, Jupiter seized the throne of the universe. Now there followed the age of silver, meaner than gold but higher in value than tawny bronze gentle spring was no longer allowed to continue unbroken the king of the gods divided the year into four new seasons summer changeable autumn winter and only a short spring the sky for the first time burned and glowed with a dry white heat and blasts of the wild wind froze the rain into hanging icicles people now took shelter in houses their homes hitherto had been caves dense thickets or brushwood fastened together with bark. For the first time also corn was sown in long ploughed furrows, and oxen groaned beneath the weight of the heavy yoke. A third age followed the Silver Age, the Bronze Generation. Crueler by nature, more ready to take up menacing weapons, but still not vile to the core, the final age was iron. The floodgates opened and all the forces of evil invaded, a breed of inferior metal. Loyalty, truth, and conscience went into exile, their throne usurped by guile and deception. Treacherous plots, brute force, and a criminal lust for possession. Sailors spread their sails to the winds they had tempted so rarely before, and the keels of pine that had formerly stood stock still on the mountain slopes presumptuously bobbed in the alien ocean. The land which had been as common to all as the air or the sunlight was now marked with the boundary lines of the wary surveyor. The affluent earth was not only pressed for the corpse and the food that it owed men, also found their way to its very bowels and its wealth which the god had hidden away in the home of the ghosts, by the sticks was mined and dug out as a further incitement to wickedness. Now dangerous iron and gold, more dangerous even than iron, had emerged. Grim war appeared, who uses both in his battles, and brandishing his clashing weapons in hand, bespattered with slaughter men throve on their thefts no guest was safe from his host no father secure with his daughter's husband love between brothers was found but seldom 
men and their wives would long for each other's demise. Wicked stepmothers brewed their potions of deadly wolfsbane. Sons would cast their fathers' horoscopes prematurely. All duty to gods and to men lay vanquished, and justice the maiden was last of the heavenly throng to abandon the blood-drenched earth. The upper air was not to be left in greater peace than the earth below. The story goes that the giants aspired to the throne of heaven and built a path to the stars on high, by piling mountain on mountain. Then it was the almighty Jupiter launching his lightning bolts to shatter Olympus and shook Mount Pelion down from its base on the ridges of Osa. When, crushed by the mass they had raised, those fearsome bodies lay prostrate. Mother Earth, as the story continues, now steeped and drenched in the blood of her offspring, gave fresh life to the seething liquid. Unwilling that all the fruits of her womb should be lost and forgotten, she turned their blood into human form. But the new race also looked on the gods with contempt. Their passionate lust for ferocious violence and slaughter prevailed. You'd have known they were born of blood. When Jupiter, son of Saturn, looked down from the heights of heaven, he sighed and remembered the gruesome banquet served at Lycoan's table, a recent event and not yet publicly rumored. Mightily angry, as only Jove can be angry, he called a general assembly and all responded at once to his summons. In cloudless skies you can clearly see a path in the heavens. Men call it the Milky Way, well known for its brilliant whiteness. This is the road which the gods must take to the mighty thunderer's royal palace, the well-thronged halls to the right and the left, with their doors flung open, belong to the gods of the highest rank. The common divinities live outside, right here the elite, and heavenly powers that have established their hearths and homes, and this is the place which, if I could muster the boldness to say it, I'd not be afraid to describe as the Palatine Hill of the Firmament. After the gods had taken their seats in the marble chamber, Jove, enthroned on a dais and clutching his ivory scepter, shook the awesome locks of his head three times and again, so causing the earth and the sea and the constellations to tremble, then opened his lips to give vent to his wrath in the following manner. The fear that I feel today for the sovereign power of the universe equals my fear when each of the snake-footed giants was striving to lay his hundred hands on the sky and make it his own. Fierce as that enemy was, its impetus sprang from a single body and source, but now I am forced to commit the whole race of mankind to destruction, wherever the ocean roars on the shore. By the streams of the Stygian river below, I swear I shall do it. Let other cures be attempted first, but what is past remedy calls for the surgeon's knife, lest the parts that are sound be infected. I have my demigods, all those powers of the countryside, nymphs and fauns and satyrs, my woodland spirits who dwell on the mountains. These we have not yet chosen to welcome to heavenly honors, but let us allow them to at least dwell on the earth we have given them, or do your honors believe their safety is firmly assured? When I, who am lord of the lightning and master of all gods, am the object of plots hatched up by that infamous savage Lycaon, the house was in an uproar, passions blazed as they called for the blood of the reckless traitor, as, when that band of disloyal malcontents raged to extinguish the name of Rome by murdering Caesar, all mankind was suddenly struck by a terrible fear of grievous disaster to come, and the whole world shuddered in horror. And just as your people's loyal devotion is welcome to you, Augustus, so is his subjects to Jove. A word and a gesture sufficed to control the murmuring hubbub, and all were silent. Then Jupiter broke the silence again to make his pronouncements. Like Haean has paid for his crimes, so far you may rest assured, but let me describe his offense and the punishment meted out. An evil report of the times has come to my ears, desirous of proving it false. I made my descent from the heights of Olympus and wandered over the earth, a god disguised as a mortal. It would take too long to recount the story of all the wickedness I discovered. The truth was worse than rumor reported, crossing over the high Arcadian mountains, Maenalus, home of wild beasts, Kylene, and cold pine-covered Lycaeus. I entered the palace of King Lycaon and ventured beneath his inhospitable roof in the twilight hour of the nightfall. I gave a sign that a god had come, and the common people turned to their prayers. 
Lycaon began by mocking their piety. Then he said, Is it a god or a mortal? I'll settle the matter by using a simple test. There will be no doubt where the truth lies. His plan was to make a sudden attack in the night on my sleeping body and kill me. This was his chosen method of proving the truth. Not content with that, he applied his sword to the throat of a hostage sent from Epirus, and under my own protection, and while the man's flesh still held some warmth, he roasted part of it over the fire and poached the remainder in boiling water, then set this repast on the table. My moment now had arrived. My lightning of vengeance struck, and the palace collapsed in ruins, on top of the household gods, who shared the guilt of the master. Frightened out of his wits, Lycan fled to the country, where all was quiet. He tried to speak, but his voice broke into an echoing howl. His ravening soul infected his jaws. His murderous longings were turned on the cattle. He still was possessed by bloodlust. His garments were changed to a shaggy coat and his arms into legs. He was now transformed to a wolf, but he kept some signs of his former self. The grizzled hair and the wild expression, the blazing eyes and the bestial image remained unaltered. One house has fallen, but more than one has deserved to perish. The demon of madness is holding dominion the wide world over. You'd think that the human race had joined in an evil conspiracy. This is my sentence. Let all of them speedily pay for their crimes. Jove has spoken. Some fueled his anger further by cheering loudly, while others simply expressed their approval by clapping. But still a murmur went round. The loss of the human race will be widely deplored, and what will a world bereft of mortals be like in the future? Who will bring to our altars the offerings of incense? Is earth to be left to the mercies of ravaging wild beasts? Such were their questions, but Jupiter told them not to be anxious. He would take care of the future, he said, and he promised to breed a new race of miraculous birth, unlike the people before. 